Hi, you've clicked on to today's Tropical Tidbit for Friday, April 19th, and it's been about a month or a little more since I released my hurricane outlook for the Atlantic in mid-March, and I'd like to bring you up to speed on some of the model forecasts that have come out since that time. This is the European forecast for August, September, October, the peak months of the hurricane season for uh, the tercile categories of mean sea level pressure, and the orange colors here indicate the ensembles think that it will be above normal in the Atlantic, and this is a bit of a flip from last month when it showed mostly white in here, indicating a kind of a neutral look. It didn't really know what to do with the pattern, thought it might be near normal. And it's interesting because this was trending away from something like this. It was looking more like this earlier in the year, then it trended away the last two months towards a more neutral pattern, and I thought that the European was trying to flip over uh, to a more lower than normal pressure pattern, more favorable for Atlantic hurricane activity. But as it stands, this is a very hostile look for the Atlantic in the summer. And uh, it may be uh, that this is due to its El Nino forecast, which we'll see in a second. But here's for May, June, and July. So the immediate three-month period following this forecast, you can see it still shows above normal pressure. If this forecast starts to go wrong in May and June, and this doesn't pan out, and instead we have lower than normal pressure north of the uh, deep tropics here, then we know that the European is off its rocker a little bit on this forecast. If it doesn't get this right in the immediate future, then we know it's a little bit off. And we'll see what its May forecast comes up with next month. But for right now, we will be watching in the near term to see how this starts verifying. Now, I think the reason the European may be going towards the solution is the fact that right now, its uh, Enzo plume is weighted uh, fairly warm, closer to an El Nino. The ensemble mean probably goes a little bit like this in here. And it gets pretty close to the El Nino threshold, threshold it, but doesn't quite get there. Notice uh, several members actually really uh, get really bullish with this El Nino and try to push it into even the strong category up here. But then you see some of the ensemble members down here going towards a La Nina. So the spread in here by the peak of the hurricane season is September in September is ridiculous. It's about a 2 degree Celsius spread in the Nino 3.4 region. So this is almost a useless forecast. And um, But it is weighted warm, which means the ensemble mean may be inclined to go towards an El Nino-ish pattern, which would be the high pressures in the Atlantic in here. So that could be why. It's interesting to note that the Japanese model, which came out with its April forecast yesterday, has a cool weighted a uh, neutral Enzo signal closer to La Nina, though, than the European through the hurricane season. And its forecast here for precipitation shows wetter than normal in blue colors here for the deep tropics for the June, July, August period. And a dry tongue out in the central Pacific indicating the La Nina ish pattern, though still neutral in technicality. So it's interesting that the La Nina weighted model, even though neutral, shows the active pattern, but just weighting it a little bit warmer than that to warm bias neutral gives us this from the European. So it may be that this, the tendency, the bias, if you will, in the Enzo uh, is going to be one of the factors that we have to watch carefully. But the bottom line is that the Enzo is uncertain, likely going to be near neutral. A persistence forecast will likely become the most skillful for this summer, and the models are rather clueless right now as to whether the Enzo will uh, do anything other than meander about the neutral line and there is no strong signal either way. Usually if we have an El Nino or a La Nina coming on it's fairly easy to use that as a scapegoat for the general pattern that we usually get with an El Nino or a La Nina. It usually guarantees a lot of stuff for us. This map generally looks one way or the other. Uh, if we have a La Nina it's going to be high pressures out here, low pressures over here, and high pressures over here. And it's almost always like that. But if it's neutral, then we have to start guessing a little bit more, or at least using our minds a little bit more beyond the Enzo, because that's not going to be the biggest factor affecting this season. Now, here's the North American ensembles. This is the mean of the North American ensemble systems. This is for precipitation July, August, September. The green colors here indicate above normal precipitation. Notice the band in the deep tropics of uh, above normal precip, and then the dryness to the south, indicating that this is a northward displacement relative to normal of the intertropical convergence zone, which indicates African waves are coming off, propagating westward. They're being wetter than normal, more convective than normal, and uh, possibly developing into more tropical cyclones than they would relative to normal. So this is indicating an active hurricane season, and again, kind of dryness in here indicates that the model is kind of leaning towards a more La Nina-ish pattern than it is an El Nino-ish pattern, which allows the Atlantic to go. 
Now so far this has all been model discussion, what the models are forecasting, what the computer thinks. What can we learn from what we've observed so far this year? And we have observed a couple of things. I started tracking sea surface temperatures as analyzed by the climate data analysis system, which is the initialization for the CFS model and uh, for the CFSR reanalysis. And I've had this running since the beginning of March or so, and uh, we have about 40 to 50 days of data now. And you can see that we've been running above normal. This is for the Atlantic Main Development Region. And uh, we had a nice spike to about plus one at the end of March, and then we tanked all the way down to 0 0.2. And the reason this happened is because the NAO started changing. We had a negative NAO all through the end of the winter, and then it started trending towards positive. And when it started flipping, uh, things started happening. Here's the sea level pressure anomalies so far this month. This is during the transition period of the NAO. Notice that we still technically had a negative NAO during this period when the sea surface temperatures in the Atlantic were cooling. We had high pressure over Iceland here, low pressure to the south. This is technically a negative NAO, but you see that it's starting to shift northward here, which means we start getting higher pressure where the Bermuda high is, and this caused an anomalous pressure gradient and stronger than normal trade winds, which caused a cooling of the ocean surface during this time. This was when uh, the temperature was tanking in here. Um, but notice now, so here, here's the observed. You see we're now actually positive, and we're forecasted to stay positive in the NAO for through the end of the month by the GFS. So you might be thinking, well, okay, that means the ocean temperature is going to tank and it's probably bad news for ocean temperatures and they're probably going to cool even more than they already have. Uh, but actually this isn't forecasted to be the case. This is GFS week one surface zonal wind which means the eastern east-west component of the wind anomaly. The orange colors here represent anomalous westerlies which means that the trade winds which are usually out of the east are weaker than normal here over the tropics. And week two kind of the same thing, a little bit weaker than normal even in week two. You notice the trade wind band is farther north than normal here. The high pressure, the Azores high, is a little bit farther north than normal, allowing the trade winds to weaken in here because there's lower pressure uh, just to the north of the MDR. Now, this is interesting because what this means is that when we had the NAO negative, we had warming water, we transitioned and it dipped, and now that it's going positive, even though it's positive, it has a weak trade wind pattern, which is not typical for the positive NAO, and you can see we're already starting to blip a little bit up here again in the sea surface temperatures. So what this means is that the NAO is unable to um, strengthen the trade winds, and no matter what phase the NAO is in, the pattern favors warmth of the tropical Atlantic, and the only time the tropical Atlantic cools is when the NAO is in transition, which makes sense because the dipoles have to move north and south. So the Atlantic wants to stay warm and it wants to keep low pressure over this region of the world. And t this to me indicates that it seems a little unlikely that during the summer the European forecast will verify if the pattern, despite the NAO, is trying to keep low pressure in here um, and keep the water warm. I think this is going to be significant. Now here's the current sea surface temperature anomalies. You can see it's still warm in here despite the dip that we had. Uh, due to the NAO transition, it's still pretty warm and starting to get warmer again. You can see the cooler water to the north and warm water near Greenland, so it's the positive Atlantic tripole signature that we talked about in March, and you can see the cool PDO still sticking its nose out here in the eastern Pacific. And you can see we still have a neutral Enzo in general. Now what's interesting is, again, we're, we're looking for the areas where heat, the most anomalous heat is, and in general the most instability will be where the warmest water is relative to normal. And you can see that we have two main areas of heat right now, Western Pacific and the tropical Atlantic. Now this region is interesting because you might think, okay, so La Nina, trade winds are stronger in here, convergence, warm water here, this could promote a large area of upward motion and instability in the Western Pacific here, but it actually doesn't always happen that way because in the summertime if you bunch up all the warm water in here towards the maritime continent, often it just discharges in here and defaults to the monsoon circulation, which ends up becoming stronger than normal, and most of the upward motion actually occurs over southern Asia, and you actually get a detrimental effect to the western Pacific. To illustrate this, here is the correlation of sea surface temperatures with 
Indian monsoon precipitation during the summer. Notice that we get the warmth over here, kind of a La Nina-ish look to the east, cool in the Indian Ocean, and this means that right now there's above normal precipitation in the monsoon region. So the monsoon is strong when you get warm water here. This matters because if you now look at the correlation of monsoon precipitation with the precipitation field, you see, of course, wet in the monsoon region, and despite warmer than normal sea surface temperatures that tend to occur in here, it's drier than normal. These blue colors are dry. And it's not that strong of a correlation, but it's enough to show you the relationship that when the monsoon is strong and the sea surface temperatures are warm in here but nowhere else, it actually doesn't enhance upward motion in this region much. So what happens, the whole point of this, is that a pattern like this forces the upward motion over here, usually, gets the monsoon going, but you also have the Atlantic warm. So what happens is this whole area, the African, Atlantic, Indian, zonal overturning circulation becomes strong, and it, in general, this area of the world becomes active, and the Pacific just tanks, and you get sinking air all through most of the equatorial Pacific, and the Indian monsoon, um, there's some research that shows it can enhance African wave activity, and then all the upward motion goes to the Atlantic Basin instead of trying to focus over here. So this pattern as it stands right now is one that I think focuses the upward motion in the tropical Atlantic for the summer. And if if something drastic doesn't happen to change this, or if we get a strong El, if we don't get a strong El Nino out here, then this is going to be something that favors Atlantic activity uh, during the hurricane season in the tropics. And I think the European will therefore be wrong, and I'm still holding to what I said in March that this pattern should be trending towards a more active one, and indeed all the other models except the European are going that way. Uh, so the European is kind of a lone wolf, which doesn't usually happen. So based on observations right now, the NAO is unable to strengthen the trade winds in the Atlantic, it's unable to cool the water no matter what phase it's in right now, and as we go into May, uh, we're having a pattern, I don't, I didn't put this on here, but the CFS is showing lots of high pressure in the equatorial Pacific, and the only place where there's low pressure in the tropics is in the Atlantic for the month of May. And that kind of a pattern in May sets you up. If we get that to verify in May, we're in for an active hurricane season, as I forecasted a month ago, and I'm sticking to now. So that's some of the trends that we're looking at right now. We'll continue to watch the patterns develop. We have a couple months to go. Skill is still low this far out, especially with the um, El Nino regions fairly uncertain in here. They'll likely be near neutral during the summer. But the trend in the pattern right now is weighted towards the Atlantic being an active place during the hurricane season, and I think it will be likely the strongest tropical basin relative to normal uh, during the Northern Hemisphere summer. So that's what we're looking at, and um, that's it for today. Thanks for watching.